Yes, ma'am. I have reached. Doctor Sun, uh, J. Prasad is there. So just touch. yes, yes, ma'am. I I just messaged him. Uh, uh, he was busy with lecture and demonstrations. I I'll meet him in evening. Uh, ma'am, uh, there is also one update that. Uh, because of some last minute reason uh, sudipta sir will not be able to join uh, because of his some personal health issues so uh, he'll not be able to join as of no worries we have dr sandeep who will yes. be calling one yes huh? ma'am <laughs> it's aig right behind him uh, yes, <laughs> you have made a very nice uh, 3d background for yourselves it looks good <laughs> so do you have a screen now uh, you know a flat screen which allows you to have a no distortions on the piche wala image you asking me yeah yeah i'm asking you and there are sometimes these green screen filters and all that okay thing. so you want me to change that no no this looks perfectly fine i'm just asking you what is the ha see you have a green screen na yeah that's <laughs> fine you can switch over flawlessly into that one Yeah, I can. Yeah, I think that looks nice. Yeah, <laughs> but has entered into VFX also after AI is uh, VFX also. <laughs> okay, wonderful, wonderful. So we have three minutes to go, and uh, we'll go live in three minutes. Thank you, Doctor Sandeep, for joining us. Uh, we have also Thank invited you, our surgeons to join, uh, so that uh, this is an area which <coughs> interested. So. Just now we finished our G rounds where we have a common forum with our surgeons. Yeah, that's been there for more than twenty five, thirty years. <laughs> so 90. you were here from which year to which year? So ninety one to ninety four, I was there as MD resident. Okay. And uh, one year in hepatology thereafter, and then uh, DM. So during MD days, also you when we posted in uh, gastroenterology, used to come to these rounds. Oh, Aki Adams round and uh, GI yeah. surgical rounds, all those things were there. Yeah. And Doctor Kataria and Doctor Nagi would have been there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So all the residents are looking forward to learning from you. Thank you once <laughs> again for joining. So let me know when you have to share my screen. I'll do that. Yeah, we have two minutes to go. Doctor Jimmy sure. will first share. Uh, Doctor Jimmy, can you please share the slides of our meeting, and then I think I will take. Uh, I will. I will have the privilege of introducing Doctor Lakshakir, since we don't have uh, Doctor Sudeep today. Share the screen. Ma'am will be live in one minute. So okay. Mr. Kamal is uh, he will share the first introduction slide and afterwards uh, he'll uh, uh, make uh, Dr. Sandeep sir as a host and uh, after that Sandeep sir will share his slides. And uh, Jimin, uh, in the end you are. Ma'am, you are mute. I am not able to hear you. No, no, she is not mute. She, I can hear her. No, I am just saying in the end you are not on the session. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry, sorry, uh, my mistake. Sorry. In the end, you announce the next session. So yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, it it is there on the slides. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yes. I think we have. Mr. Kamal, can you please share the first slide? Mr. Kamal. I've shared it. Okay. So I think, uh, Mr. Kamal, you can start the session. Session. Recording in progress. Yes, it has already started, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session of the E Part Shala. This is a combined venture of PGI Aims SGPGI E Part Shala, and we have had a series of eminent speakers speak to our postgraduates as well as budding gastroenterologists. on very important topics which are required for the beginners and we have today none other than dr sandeep lakhakia who is the director of endoscopy and us at the asian institute of gastroenterology aig hospital hyderabad he has extensive work on this area including a lot of work in the area of us and anybody who is interested in endoscopy in india would know him 
So, and also he is a very uh, affable person and very approachable for you to learn from him. And looking forward to hearing him on this topic, biliary structure, assessment and management. Over to you, Dr. Lankitya. Thank you, Dr. Usha. And at the outset, I would like to thank uh, <clears throat> PGI, especially Jamil and Dr. Usha and uh, my friend Sudipta, whom we are missing today. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> you able to see my slides? Yes, sir. Clear. Okay. So once again, thank you very much. And uh, let me move forward. In the next half an hour to 40 minutes, I'll be speaking on uh, biliary structure, their assessment and management. And uh, what are the challenges that an endoscopist we face or a gastroenterologist we face when we see these problems? Is my voice okay, Jamil? Yes, sir. Very okay. clear. Perfect. Okay. okay. So the first thing that comes in mind when we are dealing with any patient who has a biliary stricture with or without jaundice when they come to us is whether the problem is of malignancy or it's a benign etiology. Where is a likely blockage in the bile duct uh, based on the Blismuth classification which we often resort to. Whether it's intrinsically a problem of the bile duct it's a biliary pathology or something else which is compressing from outside whether the patient is operable or not. And if not, if we have to drain, then how do we drain? Percutaneously, ERCP wise, plastic stent, metal stent, covered, uncovered, single stent, multiple stent, and so on and so forth. This, these are things which comes in our mind of. So <clears throat> these are the issues I will be covering in this talk in next half an hour or so. Moving forward, uh, when we have these di diagnoses in hand, this red line decides Anything above it is called as perihilar block, where the cystic duct opens in the bile duct. That's called as a hilum. Above that is hilum. So the common hepatic duct, the confluence right and the left hepatic duct origin is all perihilar structures. Anything below is called as distal bile duct structure. Below the cystic duct in a common garden anatomy, I'm not talking about low cystic duct insertion, is everything is called distal bile duct. So the block Lower down in the pancreatic head is called as also lower uh, lower uh, bile duct obstruction. Mid part is also called as lower bile duct obstruction. And the common pathologies in malignancy is cholangiocarcinoma, carcinoma gallbladder, very often seen in north, even HCCs. In the lower bile duct below the red line, we have pancreatic cancers, periampillary cancers, nodes which can press on the bile duct. Among the benign pathologies, the most common is post-surgical, especially post-cholecystectomy, often after post-transplant, in association of primary sclerosing cholangitis. In the lower part, the diseases, benign diseases are chronic pancreatitis, IgG4 cholangiopathy, which can occur in entire part, or even PSC can occur in the lower part. There's some rarer cause, which I'm not alluding to, and we can discuss that later on. So clinically, how do you evaluate, start the evaluation of these patients? How to differentiate clinically? So obviously, the age comes first into the mind. Patient above 60, more likely to malignancy. Younger age, more likely to benign. But these are all likelihood. They're not definitive possibilities. Then clinical situation in which the patient has come to you. If you had recent surgery in the past, say post cholestectomy surgery in the hepatic hilar area, and stricture follows soon after that, then it is likely to be surgically related. Chronic pancreatitis setting also is <clears throat> equally important to let us know. And same if the patient has a history of PSC. Over here, I would like to say that those who have post-cholecystectomy stricture and if the gallbladder has not been subjected to histology, then we also may be looking at a, bin, a malignant biliary stricture which has been missed by a missed opportunity of looking at the gallbladder. So always insist on getting the gallbladder histology even if it looks normal to the surgeon. Then we also look at the uh, CA99 levels. If it's very high, it suggests malignancy. But very high values are also seen in cholangitis. So one should be wary in how to differentiate between the two. And last but not the least is a very important part is imaging. The cross-sectional imaging, the high quality ones with contrast enhancement in all three phases will tell us uh, the likelihood of the pathology that we are dealing with. Among the cross-sectional imaging, the the CT is the, the most 
preferred one. But even MRCP is sometimes required if we are looking at hilar block and if there are more than bilateral block and if it's extending deeper down. So these are the classical examples of a hilar stricture, another hilar stricture with bilateral IHBRD. And even an ultrasound or endoscopic ultrasound can show a very thick walled CBD or CHD in the hilar area. If it's very close, you can consider FNA if if the patient is unresectable. I'll touch upon it later. So the aim in a patient who has a suspected or a confirmed malignant biliary stricture is surgery. Let me repeat it once again. Our aim in management of a patient of any biliary stricture which is likely to be malignant should be surgery. We should not just rush into draining the biliary system as an endoscopist and sometimes we end up contaminating the biliary system, which delays the surgery, which delays the prognosis and overall scenario. So surgery with R0 resection is the only hope of cure. And our aim as a team should be to get the surgery if possible, if it's a malignant biliary structure. And accurate staging is paramount in this. For example, those who have an R0 resection after surgery have a very high likelihood of survival for at least three and a half to four years. If it's an R1 resection where the margins are still positive and the surgeon has gone ahead with surgery and histology comes as, as, as margins positive, the survival is still very good. It's about two years or so. And those who have locally advanced disease, in that case, if surgery is done, then the survival is not very good. So surgery, uh, resection, or uh, the success of resection depends on accurate staging. And we should strive our best to do upfront staging before we start attempt any intervention. Now looking at how to, to diagnose these problems, uh, often the, EU, sorry, the CT test will tell you that there is a hilar structure or upper bile duct structure, but what's the pathology? We can interrogate such lesions from very close quarters. And this is a hilar structure being seen by a linear EUS where this is the common hepatic duct area. And then there's a little bit of thickened wall where the green arrow comes. But it's below the two major vessels, the portal vein and the hepatic artery. And if we try to take FNA, one, the yield is very poor. Second, we will be hitting the vessel and risk of complications happen. And third, we can also cause local metastasis and which can affect the outcome. But if we see the image like this, a node which is quite hypoechoic and round to oval in shape, then we can target this by FNA and take a, di a biopsy or a, or a cytology. So look for a node which is missed on other imaging. Sometimes in less than 10-20% patients, we can have a polypoidal mass in the bile duct which is dilated. This is a upper CBD or a CHD area. This is the gallbladder and we, as we talk around, we see the bile duct. And this is not sludge. The reason I'm saying it's not sludge, when you put Doppler on it, it has a vessel inside it. And you can trace the, stress, the CBD from top to bottom and see the virtually extent of the tumor. But nevertheless, even if you see this, don't do EUS FNA. This patient is potentially resectable and doing an FNA from the primary mass will make him inoperable or it can have some tissue spread on the needle track. So if you have a load, certainly we should go ahead. But primary tumor, if it's resectable by, by cross-sectional imaging, just diagnosis by imaging of EUS is good enough. Do not do FNA. That's the message I want to convey. Now, having said that biliary strictures can be in upper part or the lower part. And the commonest cause of the lower CBD obstruction is pancreatic head cancer. Here is a mass in the head of the pancreas. And here we can do an FNA. And this is transduodenal FNA because this patient, if required for surgery, will undergo whipples and the needle track will also come out with the specimen. If you have a lower end cholangiosis, certainly you can do that from the lower end or from the duodenum. If you have lymph node or any other cause for metastasis, which is compressing the bile duct, you can also take FNA from there. There have been publications of taking FNA from different part of the cholangiocarcinoma. This is a hilar tumor. If you have a very good view and the patient is inoperable for any reason, 
then certainly we can pass an FNA needle. But if it's potentially resectable clinically or ECOG staging wise, grading wise, then we should avoid. So the role of EOS in, in bile duct structure or cholangiocarcinoma is that we look for the primary aim is to only look at the tumor if you can see it and see if it's inoperable for any reason. So technical challenges will always come when the intervening blood vessels happen, but risk of tumor seeding is there. If you have a lymph node, certainly you can do it. FNA is easy, safe. However, the appearance of the nodes can have its different prediction. The role of US also comes in intervention if a need arises for biliary drainage, which we can discuss later again. The most important investigation or the method of uh, treatment that we use for uh, biliary structures is ERCP, and it has several uh, uh, aspects to it. The diagnostic purpose is uh, to do an ERCP. At the time, you can take a tissue acquisition and then you can drain the system. Also, we can do ablation if required, which I can discuss in the latter part of the talk. And when we do tissue acquisition by ERCP, either we pass a brush over the guide wire and scrape it over several times. And then these exfoliated cells are expelled on the slides. And these are examined by the pathologist. You can also do a biopsy with, a wire with or without wire guidance. And you can target the tip of the, the, the forceps and these are different types of forceps, not the common garden forceps that we use for endoscopy biopsy. These are very flexible, spring-like mechanisms in the biopsy forceps, which are passed under fluoroscopy and target the stricture site, and then you can take biopsies. However, the yield of brush and the biopsies is very poor, to say the least. The sensitivity is about 50%. Specificity, yes, if you find cells, you diagnose the problem. But if you don't find cells, which is less than 50% by brushing and slightly more than biopsies. So if cells are there, then the positive predictive value goes up, but it has very high negative predictive value too. Which means that you can miss a tumor which is there because majority of the cholangiocarcinomas are skirrus variety where the cells are very less. Also, the tumor is outside the bile duct like a pancreatic cancer or a lymph node which is compressing the bile duct, obviously you'll get nothing out of it unless the, the disease has infiltrated the bile duct. So yield is higher for a primary cholangiocarcinoma and poorer for a, a, a pancreatic head cancer or a lymph node which is compressing the bile duct. The other limitations of this ERCP guided brush cytology and biopsy is it's difficult to access. Sometimes you cannot reach it in spite of the best efforts. The limitations of fluoroscopic targeting you get very suboptimal tissue material. And as I said earlier, the extrinsic tumors and inflammation and desmoplastic reactions will have a very poor yield. <coughs> Excuse me. So the diagnostic yield of US FNA, as I was mentioning earlier, compared to ERCP in a higher biliary obstruction is very poor for US FNA. But for a distal obstruction, that is pancreatic head mass, the yield is quite high. This includes not only cancer head of pancreas, but also cholangiocarcinomas, which are smaller in variety. And that's why this yield is lesser than actual pancreatic head masses. But this is higher for ERCP guided tissue acquisition. And the ERCP yield is lower, is has a lower yield at lower end and higher yield at the upper end, and vice versa for US guided tissue acquisition. So this would kind of make it easy to understand. So if you have higher structure, go for ERCP, brush cytology, and other methods of, of tissue acquisition. If it's a lower end obstruction, you can use EUS as a primary modality for tissue acquisition. Then comes the concept of cholangioscopy. And this has really made revolutionize our management of uh, bile duct strictures. And there are two major varieties of uh, cholangioscopy. That is per oral cholangioscopy, as the name suggests, it goes by mouth. It's generally through uh, the... ERCP scope as a baby scope. And there's also concept of percutaneous cholangioscopy where we first do a PTBD and through that PTBD catheter a few days later when the track has matured, you can pass your cholangioscope through the channel, through the same uh, track. Among the per oral cholangioscopy, which is uh, uh, quite uh, widely available now, are the two main category is a two operator cholangioscopy and a single operator cholangioscopy. As the name suggests, two operator cholangioscopy means there are two operators, two endoscopists 
who work in tandem and do the cholangioscopy. And this is the mother-baby scope system where one person holds a therapeutic ERCP scope with a 4.2 channel and through that the baby scope goes which is about 3.6 channel millimeter channel as uh, uh, diameter scope where a single operator cholangioscopy the common garden is a spyglass cholangioscopy as you all must be aware of it and i'll tell you in the next few slides another category of the single operator cholangioscopy which is uh, uncommonly used in ultra slim upper endoscope this is a nasal endoscope which is passed through the duodenum uh, when a sphincterotomy is wide and the bile duct diameter is is big you can slide your erc uh, this uh, slim scope also, there is one more scope called the double bending scope, which can also go inside. So it has two bends, one at the tip and one about 15 millimeters, 15 centimeters uh, distal to the tip. So let me talk about the mother baby scope. So this is a mother baby scope where the, uh, the main person is holding the mother scope and the co-operator is operate using the cholangioscope or the baby scope, which goes through the channel of the mother scope. The system is looking like this. This is a fiber optic variety of the cholangioscope, but currently also the, uh, the electronic version is also available. The imaging is very good, just like the upper GI scope that we have, and you can also use the NBI mode. However, it is not easily available or widely available, and it needs two endoscopies to operate, and hence it is out of favor. Plus, it's, it's delicate and, and expensive. Let me show some images of this. So, this is the baby scope going through a sphincterotomized papilla. You insert it quite similar to the uh, regular spyglass cholangioscope, which most of you must have seen. The only difference is it has only two-way deflection, up and down. and But the image quality is fantastic. So once you come very close by to the strictures area, you can press the button and get the NBI imaging. And the vascularity suggests that this is a, a, just like in NBI imaging, you get that it looks likely to be tumor. And since the biopsy channel is bigger than the spyglass, you can take biopsies as well. Another example on the left side of the panel is a highly vascular tumor strictures area. In NBI, you can see the the very nice tortuous corkscrew vessels, which is sine quinone of a malignancy, and you can target your biopsies from this area. But it's out of favor because of the requirement of two operators and not easily available and the cost. However, the image is quite good and you have the NBI en enhancement also. Now coming to the most commonly available Cholangioscope is the spyglass cholangioscopy. And as you all know, that this is a 10 French catheter system, which has four-way deflection. Unlike the mother baby, which has two-way deflection, you have four-way steering. It has four lumens at the tip, two for the, for the water irrigation, one for the accessory and one for the biopsy. You can, <clears throat> but it's a single-use device and that's why it becomes very expensive. And the major advantage it is you can plug and play. You can just bring the assembly in the endoscopy suit, attach it to the button, to the electronic, uh, the channel there and the electricity and then just start playing it. You can go directly over the wire or can directly go after sphincterotomy is done. The major advantage is a single operator can operate everything, the mother as well as the baby, four-way deflections, levers to lock the position, you can do continuous irrigation by foot paddle and very good visualization. The major disadvantage is the cost and it's a disposable equipment. It's not supposed to be used more than once. There's also a risk of cholangitis, especially in higher structures. So one has to be very aware that when you are in doing a spyglass cholangioscopy for a higher structure and we inject in too much of a saline, we end up contaminating the several ducts which are blocked and often there can be a, a risk of cholangitis. So be wary of it. So the clinical applications of the spyglass is that it characterizes the indeterminate biliary structures. That means you have tried the ERCP in brushing without this and it has come as non-contributory. 
He also visualized the extent of the disease, which may be different from what you see on the ERCP for, and when you see it directly under vision. And the therapeutic implications apart from the stones is that you can help in palliation of biliary malignancy. For example, you're not able to go into the duct of choice at ERCP, which you want to drain. Then you can use uh, vision or endoscopic vision of the spyglass to direct your wire into that system, which is where you're not able to access without it. So if the cross-sectional imaging is, is not very conclusive and the biopsy and brushing are, are inconclusive, which is quite often in about 50% of cases, then we rely on to this kind of a situation. So we are aware that indeterminate structures are those where every effort to diagnose them has failed and repeated investigations are often invasive. It delays the appropriate management that is planned for the patient. It includes, in, increases the cost and adds frustration to both physician and patient. So that's why spyglass cholangioscopy is sometimes advisable where you want to be very sure of the diagnosis. However, I would like to say that one-fourth of the patient with suspected malignant biliary strictures where in spite of all efforts uh, are looking malignant and go for surgery turn out to be benign. So one should be aware of this kind of information that, and you should upfront tell your patient that it's most likely malignant, but it can be a surprise later on. And hence, surgery should be considered if the patient is potentially operable. So direct visualization by cholangioscopy helps in differentiating by looking at the structure. If it has vascularity, you can acquire the tissue under direct vision. You can delineate the margins. The malignant lesions have an irregular dilated tortuous vessels as I showed in the beginning. Villus or papillary projections can be seen or mass can be seen. Whereas benign appearance will have a very smooth appearance of the bile duct. Sometimes even scarring can be seen without any new vascularization. And it's a very homogeneous granular mucosa at the stricture site without any mass. So let me show some examples of, of patients under who underwent spyglass. Cholangioscopy. This is an area of the stricture where the spyglass is now seeing that area. You also can simultaneously see under fluoroscopy. And this is a very scarce variety of a of a tumor and hence the biopsy becomes very important a targeted biopsy on the right you see extensive vascularity very classical of a malignant structure although i must say sometimes even the autoimmune cholangiopathy also have a very similar appearance but they are generally very diffuse all along the cbd in fact, some lymphomas also look like very vascular. So one should be aware and not just give up the patient just by looking at the stricture. So the advantage is that you get good intrinsic biliary pathologies with very high accuracy. But the limitations is that you cannot, again, even after spyglass cholangioscopy, look at the extrinsic compression like from pancreatic cancers, gallbladder cancer, or metastatic disease. And some of the ductal disease like PSC, autoimmune cholangiopathy, can mimic malignancy and one that's why the biopsy becomes quite important. Some of the, the publications uh, which are directed towards spyglass uh, directed biopsy is that its ability to obtain histology under direct vision from indeterminate structure for histology has a very high sensitivity and specificity. So all those patients who have a negative cytology or biopsy upfront by ERCP can be subjected to this if situation warrants. These mini biopsy forceps which can go through 1.2 channel scope, millimeter channel scopes when compared with the standard brushings have a very high sensitivity and overall accuracy. Meta-analysis have also shown the high accuracy, sensitivity and specificity and multiple biopsies are required at least three or more to give a high diagnostic yield with sensitivity and specificity. So if you are doing it, don't do one biopsy, take at least three or more. I know it takes effort to pass the spy bite through the spy cholangioscope several times over. The first time is easy, but as the number of times increases, it sometimes becomes challenging because some of these biopsy forceps get kinked. So this was a publication which was jointly by German group, the Hong Kong group and the Indian group from Hyderabad. And they summarized or concluded that it spyglass in indeterminate biliary structure is safe and effective, highly sensitive, and both visual and histologic diagnosis of indeterminate biliary structures can be established. 
So in this segment, I would just like to sum it up by saying that several types of cholangioscopy systems are available. Newer score cholangioscopes are friendly and efficient, and you can directly see and take tissue, and you can also do direct therapy as well. Moving forward, uh, the area of interest which is for most young endoscopy is biliary drainage. Am I right? Okay. So before we start draining, I think one should have an understanding of this picture. Look at it very carefully. So it depends on where the tumor is located or where the stricture is located. I won't say tumor, but stricture. If the stricture is located in the common hepatic duct area or it's a perihilar stricture, but the confluence is patent. This is a very important information and every effort should be made to get this information out. If you have a type 1 stricture, bismuth type 1, then single stent may be good enough. But you have a type 2 stricture where the tumor goes into the confluence and the right and the left system are separated from each other. You can still do endoscopy and drain both the sides if you happen to contaminate or pass a guide wire. If the guide wire goes on both sides, that's the best situation. But if it doesn't go on both the sides, still do not worry. You drain the site which has a larger volume, that is the right side of the liver, provided it's not atrophic and left is not hypertrophic. But if you're failing, then don't hesitate in calling your intervention radiology friend and take help from them to pass guide wire and then you can place by ERCP route using a roundover procedures. The situation becomes different when it's type 3 or type 4 stricture. Type 3A is when the stricture, when the malignancy spreads into the right hepatic duct and the anterior and the posterior ducts are separated now. Here you have to drain this duct, this duct and this duct. So it has actually three systems which need to be drained, which is not often technically possible. So one should attempt to drain at least two, if not all three so that you drain the maximum liver volume. In this situation, it is often better to have a standby PTBD person if you are not confident. And if you are not confident, at least you can start off with PTBD and then convert to ERCP. Type 4 is a different ball game altogether where tumor goes deeper down and the second order branches also get blocked. Here, even if you drain one segment or two segments, it's not going to be very effective for the patient to drain off unless you have one system which is quite grossly dilated and you now are aware that that is a culprit area. But it is often best to use either PTBD or do nothing in these patients. I repeat, if it's, it is often better to start off with PTBD or do nothing in these patients because sometimes we worsen their quality of life just to satisfy our egos that we can drain it but if the patient develops cholangitis within a week's time, so if he has a survival of two or three months, you can actually make in less than a month, in a week or two, he'll have a very torpid course and you will not be happy seeing that situation. So some of the examples, this is a type 2 stricture where left duct is dilated and right system also is dilated and the stricture is here. There is a bismuth type 2 on MRCP. And when we RCP, we can in both the sides using uncovered metal stent. Uncovered because we are going in the hilum and we do not want to, to block the side branches. So coming back to the very important question is which stent to use? Plastic or metal for a malignant biliary obstruction of CBD. And in this prospective randomized control trial long time back, more than 20 years back, it showed that the metal stent is far superior than the than the plastic stent because the estimated probability of non-obstruction of, of that stent. So stent remains patent for a longer period of time if it's a metal stent and the plastic stents block very soon. Most of them get blocked by six months, even shorter than that. So the conclusion of this study was that metal stent is the most effective treatment and still holds true for inoperative malignant biliary obstruction. The only reason when we use a plastic stent is when the patient has liver metastasis. So if somebody has a liver metastasis, it means that he has very advanced disease and the survival is going to be less. In such patients, you can choose a plastic or if they can afford, then metal is as good as because you never know how things would progress. 
The second question which comes in mind is in a distal biliary obstruction whether to use covered or uncovered. Now this is a distal biliary obstruction where the block is lower or the mid part. When we use an uncovered metal stent, we have the possibility of both tumor ingrowth to the mesh of the stent or overgrowth from the edges of the stent. However, the complications are lesser once you send, place the stent in a, in a good position is because these stents do not migrate. They do not block the cystic duct or the pancreatic duct. The drawback of the covered stent or the benefit is that it prevents a tumor ingrowth. Overgrowth still remains possible just like an uncovered stent. Overgrowth means from the ends of the stent, the tumor can grow along the bile duct and come from top into the biliary system. The major drawback of a covered stent is that stent migration happens in about one third of the patient because these are not anchored well and they can migrate once the stricture opens up. They can also cause occlusion of cystic duct and cholecystitis or pancreatic duct leading to pancreatitis. Although these are more of a theoretical risk, but it can happen. And very rarely bile incrustation can also occur. So the debate of using covered versus uncovered metal stents and distal biliary obstruction uh, shows that the covered stents are as good as the uncovered stent, although the, the patency is slightly better for the covered stent. But the drawback, I said earlier, is that migration is higher. Now, what do you do in a patient who has a potentially resectable malignancy, a distal malignancy especially, and uh, you are now asked or requested by a surgical colleague in a tumor board or a multidisciplinary meeting that pre-op drainage is required. This is generally considered in patients who have acute cholangitis or very intense pruritus with some delay in surgery likely to happen. Or the surgeons are, or the team is planning to do a preoperative chemo radiation, which is quite common nowadays. In that situation, best is to relieve his jaundice so that he can undergo these things. Or if he has a very deep jaundice, and some centers prefer bilirubin of more than 15 to undergo primary drainage. And once the bilirubin comes down and they've undergone chemotherapy, uh, then they are then they can take up for surgery after three cycles or so. In this situation, always a short covered or uncovered metal stent is used over a plastic stent. The reason metals are used is because the risk of cholangitis is much lesser with a wider diameter of a metal stent. Whereas plastic stents, they will drain quickly also, but since the diameter is less than one third of a metal stent, they also tend to get blocked very soon, especially the bile is very thick above. There are several types of metal stents available. Intraductal uh, leaving the metal stent also has no benefit if the stent crosses the papilla. So if need be, you can be across the papilla, but if situation demands that your stent is inside the papilla, don't worry. They are equivocal. And let me show some examples of a stent being deployed for this uh, tumor, which is in the distal CBD pancreatic head. And you see the papilla is very bulky and infiltrated by the tumor. We are using a uncovered metal stent. And on the right side is a fully covered metal stent being placed again in a distal malignant biliary obstruction. So the way to place these stents is same, whether it's fully covered or uncovered or partially covered. Now, look, moving towards the hilar structure, I showed in the beginning the, the cartoon diagram of Bismarck type 1, 2, and 3 and how do we decide to place which stent and how many stents in each uh, situation. So if the hilar structure you can place on both the sides if possible. You can sometimes even resort to three stents, uh, which are is technically even more difficult. So how do you decide to place one stent or two stents. So this is again dependent on the bismuth classification uh, or the anatomy that we have and presence of any atrophy of the liver. Suppose you have a bilateral structure, but the left lobe is completely atrophy. There is no point draining the left system at and this situation. Just go to the right side and, and come out of it. If the patient has a portal vein and hepatic artery involvement, which kind of makes it almost inoperable, in that situation, you can uh, consider the side of draining and if any abnormal anatomy, for example, right posterior is opening to the left hepatic duct, then 
one stent on the left will actually drain more than two thirds of the liver. So those situations uh, will be guided by the MRCP or a good high quality CT scan. The invasion of hepatic artery almost always makes the patient inoperable, and so is a, a portal vein invasion. And the presence of atrophy should should guide you in which direction to drain. So what are the outcomes when we compare the, the liver volume which is drained? If you drain more than 50% compared to more than less than 50% of the liver volume, this was a publication which came more than 10 years back. Small, modest numbers, but still gives a very important information. And which is that if you drain more than 50%, then the drainage effectiveness is very good, 82% compared to almost half if you drain only one side. The risk of cholangitis after drainage is much higher if you drain only one side because there is some subclinical contamination on the other side as well, which is much lesser if you drain the both sides. And even the survival benefit is seen in patients who have a bilateral drainage. So if you see the overall survival, the median survival is only 60 days if you drain one side in a higher, higher occlusion compared to almost double in patients who have a bilateral strength placement. This uh, publication which came from uh, Jong Moon's group also showed the same thing that if you do a bilateral drainage compared to this is a bilateral curve and this is a unilateral uh, curve, the stent patency is higher if you have a bilateral drainage and same goes for the survival probability if you have a bilateral drainage. So let me go back again. So you have a higher survival if patient has a bilateral drainage compared to a unilateral drainage in a malignant biliary obstructions. Now, how to drain bilateral? So, there are two main ways of draining bilateral stent is side by side, where you place two metal stents uncovered, one by one, although both assemblies go in together, but you deploy two to centimeters on either side. And that's the final outcome of the picture. Let me show this once again. So both the assemblies are taken on either side above the stricture and then you start from one side, open up the stent by 2 centimeters, other side 2 centimeters. So you need two operators to gradually deploy and these assemblies are very fine, 6 French systems. The only caution one has to be consider when placing side by stent is that the bile duct has to be wide enough to accommodate two stents. If your bile duct is very thin, say 2 or 3 millimeters or 4 millimeters, and you place a 10 millimeter stent on both the sides, even a 8 millimeter both the sides, both the stents will compress each other and you may not get a, a good outcome. In that situation, we use something called as a stent in stent technique. As the name suggests, this is a Y formation of stent where you first place one stent on the left side, say, and then in the center, if you have a wider mesh, then you can go through this wider mesh and place the stent on the opposite side. Like in this example, this patient had the first stent on the left side and the second stent went through the central part of it to the other side. Let me show you a video of it. So, I'll before you start, you place the guide wire on both the sides first, right and left. Get the good cholangiogram. Oh, sorry. You can dilate the stricture by balloon if required. And then take one stent which has larger lattices or, or the mesh diameter is more than usual, either in entire length or at least a central part of it so that the central part overlaps the origin of the right hepatic duct as in this case and then through the central mesh you pass the other wire to the right side as you can see you can dilate the with the balloon again and then place the stent. Very rare situation you also require hepatogastrostomy or a biliary uh, cause uh, biliary <coughs> drainage by EUS not only hepatogastrostomy but even cholodocodiodonostomy can be done and depending on where the stricture is located. And one such example is this. This was a patient who had a hilar cholangiocarcinoma predominantly blocking the right side. The left was okay and he underwent a metal stent three months back. But now he comes with, a, with an obstructive jaundice 
and cholangitis because of the the disease kept increasing and the tumor as we know that grows along the bile duct wall goes to the left side as well and causes the blockage of the left hepatic duct so here we puncture the left hepatic duct from the stomach pass the guide wire inside <clears throat> create a fistula by using a over the wire cystotome and then place you can see there's no contrast going to the other side that means there's a complete right and left disconnect so this is also called as series technique where is combined ERCP and EOS technique which can be done at the same time or at two different settings as in this patient. The ERCP was done three months earlier and biliary drainage is done uh, at the time when he presented to us later on. And this is a metal stand being placed. The inner part is uncovered so it does not block the side branches and rest of the three-fourth of the stent is fully covered so it does not cause any bile leak into the peritoneum. And you can see the pus draining out is quite a gratifying results. Now moving to the last section of this talk is a palliative therapy uh, where, where if it's a malignant biliary stricture and patient is inoperable as happens in a large proportion of the patients, you can do some one of these things that is radiofrequency ablation, photodynamic therapy, drug eluting stents and introductory radiotherapy. I will only discuss the radiofrequency ablation uh, which actually means that you it's a temperature dependent energy given uh, to the stricture site this thermal injury causes local tumor necrosis. This is done under fluoroscopy guidance. For example, here, this is a stricture. It's in the mid part of the CBD. You see under cholangioscopy, the tumor there. And you place the, the electrode overlapping on the stricture under fluoroscopic vision. So here we rely on fluoroscopy. So accurate cholangiogram is important so that the electrodes can overlap. And then you burn using an external generator. You apply the current for about two minutes. It gives local heat and the stricture opens up slightly there. And this opens slightly more later on. You can follow with a plastic stent or a metal stent at the same session. So this is how the picture looks like. The advantage of US uh, of endoscopy RFA is mainly for cholangiocarcinomas. It has also been tried for pancreatic head cancer, gallbladder cancer, metastasis, but it is all, these tumors are outside the bile duct. Even if you use it, you're actually probably doing a placebo effect or only burning one part of the tumor, not the entire tumor. So it may just delay the stent blockage, but that's it. So endobiliary RFA op offers the local ablation, reduces the tumor load, delays tumor ingrowth, potentially prolongs the stent patency, opens the biliary structure and stents can expand rapidly, including the new adjuvant therapy can also be done in such patients. So there was a publication uh, almost nine years back uh, comparing PDT and RFA. Uh, PDT is a photodynamic therapy which is quite popular in the West when RFA had just arrived. Uh, PDT is very complex, has high cost, it causes photosensitivity and evidence was not, was very high at that time when RFA had just arrived. So evidence was low at this time but now more and more publications have arrived since then. But there's no photosensitivity and very easy to do. There are some adverse events and some devices. There are different devices available now. Uh, the most common one is the ELRA catheter, which has four electrodes, uh, which are uh, three millimeters apart. And the current is a multipolar electrode and the current jumps from one to the other. So you can have a long segment of tumor burnt uh, in one session. If the stricture is longer than this, you can actually overlap and burn at two sessions, at uh, two areas, uh, starting from the proximal to the distal side. And following that, you can actually place a metal stent if required. There are several publications which have shown that RFA with SEMS has an independent predictor of survival and also a predictor of survival at both at three months and six months time compared to regular thing. In the end, I would like to conclude by saying that biliary strictures can be both benign and malignant and use your uh, judgment based on clinical evidence available, the imaging, the cytology and histology, and whatever possible to be done to get the diagnosis right. We often reside to high quality cross-sectional imaging where EUS and ERCP helps in tissue acquisition. Cholangioscopy is required if it's indeterminate or upfront. And we drain by either plastic or metal stents. If it's malignant, metal is always preferred. And uh, one stent is used if it's a distal biliary obstruction. In the higher situations, if you can place both bilateral, then it's always better. Covered is used only in distal malignant biliary obstruction, but the drawback is that it can migrate. 
Uncovered is also used in distal plus also in hilar structures. The drawback is the tumor ingrowth can occur. Unilateral or bilateral depends on how much the block is, whether it's, it's type 2, type 3 or 4. Use of endobiliary RFA can be done upfront before placing the metal stents to prevent the tumor ingrowth, reduce the tumor load and prolong the stent patency which indirectly prolongs the survival benefit. Thank you very much for very kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Raktakya, for a masterly presentation. I don't think I have heard a more clearer lecture on such a wide topic and something which can be each slide was a take home message for the residents. And thank you so much for thank such you. a beautiful lecture. Uh, with this, uh, we would we can take up some questions from the audience. And here we have two people who have already commented great presentation, Dr. Bhavesh Doshi. Why is hilar operable tumors should not be EUS FNAD, but operable tail of the pancreas tumors can be FNAD? <laughs> so, uh, Bhavesh is a friend from Singapore, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad that he has joined. Uh, thank you, Bhavesh, for your question. So, operable hilar biliary malignancies, <clears throat> when you do FNA from the stomach or duodenum, we are actually ex in the peritoneal space. And that's why uh, it can have a peritoneal metastasis as a connotation or extrapolation of what we do. So if you have a lymph node, which means that disease already is spread, then you can do an FNA. But if it's a primary biliary malignancy within the border of the bile duct and not spread anywhere else, which means it's potentially resectable, most surgeons do not like it to be intervened. Now, extrapolating a question of distal uh, uh, pancreatic tail mass uh, where it can be FNAD. <laughs> Most surgeons actually want the histology there. So they can do a distal pancreatectomy with, with or without splenectomy if the tumor uh, is operable. Uh, but if your appearance, uh, say, by imaging is very classical, uh, then uh, maybe we can avoid a FNA. But there, in pancreatic cancers, the surgeons always want the histology. But but hilar cholangiocarcinomas, they are very wary because it interferes with their the surgical field. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Abhirup Chatterjee. How do you assess the adequacy of biliary drainage <coughs> based upon the bilirubin percentage reduction and time since the biliary drainage? Does it differ between benign and malignant etiology? Uh, good question, Abhirup. Uh, so, whenever the, the uh, obstruction, biliary obstruction is there for a prolonged period of time, it takes a little longer for the, the liver to start regenerating and start uh, uh, secreting the bile, which then goes through the obstructed system, which has now been covered by the metal stent. So, it will take time. That's why it, sometimes one week to two week uh, time period is taken after the index drainage for 50% reduction of the bilirubin. That's what most of the studies say, that if you have a 50% reduction of the baseline bilirubin by two weeks, that means their stent is working well. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. It doesn't differ, it doesn't differ too much by, by, by benign or malignant uh, disease. Uh, all the benign have a generally much uh, lower bilirubin compared to the malignant diseases. So what about the delta bilirubin, which is uh, often you know, talked out in a situation of a prolonged so, so, cinematic obstruction. So, delta percentage would be equal in both benign and malignant, but the absolute values will be, uh, the range would be bigger in a malignant disease compared to a benign disease. For example, a stone disease or a benign biliary strictures may have a, a very low bilirubin, say 5 or so, uh, whereas a malignancy may have a 25. So, 25 comes to say 5 or 10 after 2 weeks, whereas 5 will fall to 2 after two weeks. So, the delta will be three in benign, but 25 or 20 in, in a malignant disease. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have another question from an anonymous attendee. How long IFBRD can persist after adequate biliary drainage? Great question, actually. This is sometimes uh, I have observed that patients who have a, a disease which is there for a long time, the bile duct takes longer time to decompress. Uh, both the CBD as well as the intrahepatic ducts. Uh, <clears throat> also, if the bile duct is quite dilated and you have a malignancy, then you start thinking in terms of a underlying colloidal cyst. 
which may be the harbinger for a malignancy which is developed in the CBD. But IHBRD dropped down very fast and the presence of air in the bile duct means that your stent is working well. So I think we rely more of presence of air and some decompression of the system which takes time. It, it, it varies from the liver stiffness and the, the duration of the disease. Uh, which, uh, But I, I, I'm not aware of any objective studies which has measured the diameter of the intrahepatic bile Maybe this is a, a thesis topic for somebody to look into. Yeah. Uh, have you had encountered white bile and a relationship of white bile to prognosis? Because earlier on, surgeons used to think that if you see white bile, it indicates liver dysfunction and poorer outcomes. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that has that was a publication from uh, your alma mater, Ames, long time back. I think Vineet and uh, Anjandhar and uh, Pramod were publishing uh, quite vigorously on this aspect. And yes, when it is white bile, that means liver has been obstructed for a long time and hardly any bilirubin is coming down from the liver. So that means uh, that the, it's a prolonged obstruction. That's only and we take probably longer time for it to recover after that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bhavesh Joshi has complimented you saying that it's wonderful to see and hear your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Bhavesh, for joining us. We have another question from Dr. Rajneesh Thakur. Do we place a covered or an uncovered stent in distal malignancy? I think you answered it during the course, but do you like to... Yeah, I will I will take it again, Rajneesh. If your patient is, is an operable case and he has a deep jaundice, 15 or more, I would place a fully covered stent, a short one, four or six centimeters above the stricture and very quickly take him up for surgery if the surgeons are willing to operate, you say in a, in a cancer head of pancreas. But the only drawback is nowadays most surgeons want a chemo radiotherapy to be given up front and that, that delays the surgery and most prefer at least three cycles which takes about six weeks or so. So one must be wary that the... Uh, uh, stent should not get migrated. So you should be alert about it. At the same time, I would prefer to, so there are newer stents which have less anti, which have anti-migratory uh, features in them, like flaps or fins, which prevent uh, migration. Nevertheless, it still happens, but uh, I would prefer a fully covered sense. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Shankar Roy. Role of coaxial plastic stent with biliary cells in case of a malignant obstruction? There is no role there. Okay. Uh, then anonymous attendee again. Is there a difference in prognosis after ERCP between type 3A or type 3B? <laughs> so if it's type 3A, so I look at the liver volume now. So that upfront uh, cross-sectional CT scan will give me a volumetric assessment or an, a rough estimate of which side of the liver is bigger. If right is bigger, which is normally so, uh, it's two-third, one-third, I would prefer to place in a 3A right anterior and posterior and leave the left like that, which will get atrophied provided I've not contaminated it. So first, you should never inject contrast use the uh, your uh, MRCP as your roadmap and pass the guide wires deep inside into the right anterior and posterior and then place the stents. Try not to inject too much contrast or you inject contrast after you have accessed that selected duct by wire and inject from top down. One more thing I would, uh, a, a trick over here is to aspirate the bile before you start injecting contrast. The purpose of this is that you remove that volume of bile, say about 10 cc you have removed. Now you have a lesser volume of distribution with the contrast, which means that your pressures inside the biliary system will be much lesser and risk of cholangitis then subsequently drops. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll ask the last question before I hand over to Dr. Jimil to conduct the remaining part of it. Uh, just the question is molecular diagnostics in picking up, uh, you know, the etiology of the stricture, which has been used quite often in pancreatic structures. So what about it in the biliary structures, you know, the KRAS mutations and other mutations? Can you pick it up? I, I think Jamil can answer that better. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am, can you repeat? Sorry. No, the, the role of molecular, the, diagnostics. molecular diagnostics in the bile 
in patients who have indeterminate biliary strictures versus pancreatic strictures. In pancreatic strictures, there's a lot of work in that area. So I just wanted to look at biliary. So there is limited work on the on this kind of genetic uh, uh, work. Uh, having said that, there is some work on fish uh, in situ hybridization uh, using these molecular techniques where they look at the the uh, the chromosome abnormalities in the in the biopsy that is have been obtained. Uh, it's still not available at I, I am not aware in India. But having said that, we just about to set up at AIG the fish technique and hopefully we'll be able to answer this from an Indian perspective. It's mainly considered in patients who have PSC where the stricture, dominant stricture, whether it's malignant or benign, uh, is the issue. Yeah, over to Dr. Jimmy uh, to take on from question from Dr. Amit. Yes, thank you, ma'am. And thank you, sir, for such a masterly and lucid lecture. And ma'am has rightly said that we have not heard such a beautifully presented topic, uh, like such a vast topic, but you have already almost covered everything from diagnosis to management, from hyalus stricture to pancreatic stricture. So uh, it was really uh, you were very kind. Thank you, thank you. Uh, sir. Um, I'll I'll take first questions from uh, by the attendees. That uh, uh, what is your personal experience of acute colis or acute cholecystitis incidence after uh, fully covered SAMS placement? So the chance of a cholecystitis happening after placing a fully covered biliary SEMS is more because of uh, the tumor infiltration of the cystic duct than by the stent itself. These bile ducts are quite wide and the stent does not go almost to the margin of the uh, bile duct. So the gallbladder can keep technically draining beside the stent above it and then coming through it even if the uh, bile duct collapses. So, uh, that's more because of a tumor infiltration. So, one has to be aware of it. If that is so, then you have to use an alternate method to take care of the cholecystitis, which can occur just because the tumor infiltration. Oh. Uh, so, do you, do you think that in such, such scenario, when the pre-procedure chances, pre-procedure is suggestive of cystic duct, in involvement or you think that it is very near to the cystic duct where there you uh, you know pre uh, before putting a plastic stent uh, before putting the fully covered stent placement you cannulate the gallbladder or you try to cannulate the gallbladder to uh, drain the gallbladder in the same setting or uh, it is of uh, you don't do it in a routine uh, clinical practice no very rarely we have tried to drain the gallbladder in a malignant biliary obstruction situation if the wire happens to go then we may consider draining if you feel that the tumor is very close to the cystic duct insertion. Okay. Uh, having said that, if if my suspicion is strong that the tumor is still there in the biliary duct and it can further get compromised by the fully covered metal stent, I will resort to an uncovered stent in a distal malignant okay. biliary situation. Okay. There is a one question by Dr. Siddhartha is that if the cholingoscope is not available, is there any special technique to improve the yield of brush cytology uh, during ERCP? Yeah, so you have to be very vigorous at the time of uh, brushing. Uh, in fact, it can be done either by you or the operator, your assistant. So take the brush outside the sheath, above the stricture, and then you, depending on where it's located, if it's very lower down, then the endoscope ERCP operator does it. But if it's higher up, either you or your assistant can do it. But it has to be sc to scrape the entire length of it from top to down because some of majority of these strictures are skin variety and, and may not give a good yield. You can also combine with a with a biliary biopsy at the same setting. So which will the, the two combined together have a higher overall uh, yield of diagnosis. And uh, so one Dr. Priyansh has asked, is there any role for intraductal ultrasound in a, in a routine practice or do you use it in a... So that's going down, Priyansh, that uh, the use of IDUS in uh, diagnosing cholangiocarcinomas or biliary strictures is going down. But having said that, it can be used uh, when you are uh, with, uh, in a pre-cholangioscopy era. We were doing it for uh, looking at the bile duct wall. If the bile duct wall has intact three-layered structure, in spite of being thick at the stricture site, then it is a a benign disease, but if it has a broken three layers, just like we see in uh, EMR, ESD, EUS for uh, early gastric cancer or esophageal cancer, then it is suggestive of a malignancy. 
even the collaterals can be seen nicely there in a portal cavernoma causing uh, cholangiopathy uh, where what is the cause for stricture whether it's a, a vessel which is compressing the bile duct or it's a stricture which is formed that also can be differentiated to a to some extent it's not foolproof but it can be done but it's another technology even olympus which was producing these have actually stopped. probably it stopped uh, producing yes. it they're not pushing it hard also yes even even i think a um, uh, few years back it was uh, it was suggested that for the right hepatic artery invasion in cholangio ca whether it is resectable or not resectable you should use intraductal but practically it is very difficult to pass intraductal ultrasound uh, uh, beyond the stricture so this all appears to be more theoretical than uh, practical implications i, I think that the, the uh, uh, availability of a high resolution uh, uh, the slice ct 640 slice ct or 320 slice ct have given us such beautiful images now that the diagnostic aspect of us is almost virtually going away yes so regarding the same uh, i would like to extend the question that in in because of the high resolution ct scan now surgeons are more and more getting more and more reliable re regarding the resectability on the ct scan than on the endoscopic ultrasound so do you get still patient for the resectability of uh, pancreatic carcinoma for on es or majority it is mainly for the biopsy and mainly really for the biopsy they mainly, mainly for, for the biopsy and if we can give some subtle extra information which they are not able to get on the on a good CT, that a portal yes. vein invasion or a, or a superior mesenteric vein invasion, those kind of a things make a difference. Yes, and so if you uh, on on US, let's say if you if you think that it, it is definitely a locally advanced carcinoma, do you go ahead with a single session um, ERCP and putting up uncovered metal stent, or you just go ahead with biopsy and let surgeon decide whether they want to do. Uh, 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 biliary drainage or they want to do first a trial of chemotherapy and then and then go ahead with the uncovered stent rather than a direct uncovered stent placement. So so that's where the role of multidisciplinary therapy comes up. When you have such patients, it's best to discuss with your surgical colleague uh, up front and uh, what would they prefer. Uh, it varies from side to side because some do not look at histology as an, and they look at imaging and then they decide, okay, this may be a good candidate for surgery and it's operable. Let's not waste time. Okay. I would also like to expand over here that with good chemotherapy now, the patients are living longer in cholangiocarcinomas. And uh, there is a trend in the Eastern world, the Japan and, and Koreans are now using more and more of plastic stent uh, in drainage of higher biliary structures. And they feel that by chemotherapy and these stents, even the metal stents do get blocked. They will get blocked at six months or one year time. And if the patient is surviving by that time, now you cannot even remove a metal stent. So that becomes a, a clinically challenging scenario. Earlier, the chemotherapies were probably not, not so good. So with the prolonged survival, you are still justified to use a plastic stent in a higher biliary situation, provided you are able to exchange them on need basis or at three monthly basis uh, as that uh, pattern practice pattern can. Yeah. I think one RCT has also just came comparing uh, plastic stent versus <coughs> in a higher structure, which has shown almost equivalent results um, uh, in, even True. in a higher string. So there is one another question by uh, uh, Dr. Priyansh, average number of brushing uh, ERCP guided brush to improve the yield. So about 10 times a movement up and down uh, would give us a, a, a better yield rather than one or two times. So you look at the brush when, it, when you take it out. If it has a lot of blood in it, that means the tissue probably is good. Yes. Uh, Dr. Pardu has asked that when to give up the etiological pursuit of indeterminate structure. Let's say you are thinking it's an indeterminate structure, exhaustive workup still, we are not sure whether to it's a malignant or benign. When to give up or when to refer the patient for surgery? I think the decision should be joint from the beginning itself. And if the patient is potentially operable and has no risk factor, say, from comorbidity or the disease uh, per se, and uh, then I think we should be earlier towards erring towards the surgical side. Having said that, even the, the, the duration of the onset of disease and your efforts that you have made sincerely over to establish a diagnosis, if they have crossed three to six months and the patient is still doing fine, I think it's more often a benign disease. And there you can then, on a... On a manage as a as a benign disease patient yes so i think we have already exceeded the time but if you are if you are okay with your permission there are three four no, sure, questions. please go ahead. please go okay ahead. thank you sir 
So, uh, Mr. Dr. Amit Kumar has asked that in PSC stricture, how should you approach diagnostic approach uh, should be there in case of a P diagnosed so, case of PSC? Yeah, so that's a good question. And PSC, unfortunately, uh, is not so common in India in spite of such high uh, incidence of ulcerative colitis, which is uh, seen in about 70% of the patients with PSC. Uh, we look at if there is a patient having multiple strictures, so the differentials that come in mind is either autoimmune cholangiopathy or it's a PSC. And the age pattern also makes a difference. Uh, EUS-wise, both the bile ducts will be very thick and have a normal uh, layered architecture in that area of the stricture. A PET scan may sometimes be useful uh, when you want to differentiate from malignant versus benign, whereas the FDG... Uh, the SUV values are very high in a malignant biliary stricture compared to the inflammatory strictures of the of the PSC. But it's sometimes very, very difficult. And uh, often patient, if they have multiple strictures, uh, the surgeons, if they contemplate even for liver transplant upfront, uh, rather than uh, making their, their quality of life worse, if we try to play, place uh, strengths in all segments or several segments. Yes. There's also a policy of uh, several people who have uh, dealing with PSC is to just dilate the stricture I with a balloon and not place a stent. I think I think there was also one RCT in gastroenterology in 2018 or 19 where they have compared balloon versus uh, strict, uh, putting two week stent, which was the earlier policy. It has also shown that the balloon is more effective and less risk of uh, cholangitis compared to uh, stent placement. Yes. So regarding the same uh, question, I would like to uh, extend one question on your slide of about uh, type 4 high risk stricture. So let's say the patient is in a good performance status, the expected life expectancy around three months or something to two, three months and patient is also willing to undergo procedures. In that scenario, would you still go ahead with direct ERCP, uh, sorry, direct PTBD of all the segments or you will first try to go ahead with ERCP or US guided drainage and then followed by PTBD of the remaining segments in the same setting or, or you always go ahead with the PTBD of all the segments. So, I will not do PTPT of all segments. I think I'll select two or maximum three segments, which are the most dilated ones, which are much easier for the intervention radiologists and make them uh, pass the catheter across the structure into the duodenum. So, that will allow the internal drainage where the bile will physiologically go into duodenum. And I will also request them to take a cytology or histology at the same time if they can. Now, these same spyglass are also useful through the percutaneous route as well. So, if the upfront first session cytology is negative, which is likely to be in most scenario, then I would request them to do a biopsy percutaneously and from the area of interest uh, of the stricture to one of the second segments later on. At that time, if we have a rose available, which has been shown by Shams group that you can do rose with uh, cholangioscopy both by ERCP route or by percutaneous route, and you have suggestions of a malignancy there, then you can place a metal stand either percutaneously or by ERCP roundover technique. But uh, these are difficult challenges and I would also uh, tell the audience that not to play with fire. Yes. <laughs> these are the patients who are quite okay and suddenly, as Did you it. said, three months survival with a good ECOG score, but you try to think of draining and you can make a mess of it. I think all of us have burnt our fingers with it and I'm very, very hesitant with my white hair and, and less hair that <laughs> try not to touch those patients. Definitely, sir. Yeah, our experience and expertise speak in, in, uh, in this sense. Definitely. Uh, so, there is uh, one question by anonymous attendees that when should we stop upgradation of uh, stenting in benign biliary structure? Should we monitor bilirubin, alkaline phosphorus, or the radiological resolution? Great question. So, if you have placed uh, multiple plastic stents in a patient of benign biliary structure and uh, uh, the Guido Costaminus. Uh, uh, algorithm is to exchange every three months with increasing size of the diameter of the of the number of stents so that the diameter keeps increasing and this graded increase in the diameter of the stricture at one year uh, is generally quite effective not only at one year follow-up but even at 10 years follow-up in his long-term follow-up study. So using the same corollary now we have started using more of a fully covered metal stents and place this across the stricture. The advantage of fully covered stent, although they are costly at the at the index ERCP, but the long term or accumulative cost, if you see, then it works out actually cheaper. 
both from the cost point of view as well as the comfort point of view to the patient. And we put these stents for at least six months to one year inside. One year is our preferred method for benign biliary strictures and then take them out. If the stricture is now opened up at least three fourth or more, then there's no point in placing another stent. You can keep these patients on follow up and do a subsequent stenting on a need basis. I think LFTs will be normal because they have come back to you with a stent which is probably patent, if not blocked. And in the extension of this same question, I would like also all the residents that sir has already published uh, RCT on uh, benign biliary structure fully covered metal stent versus plastic stent. And I think all the residents should be aware of that uh, RCT. Yeah, that's in a setting of a chronic pancreatitis. Chronic also, pancreatitis. Other etiologies also, there was a combined group international effort, but mainly in chronic pancreatitis. It yes. works quite well if the structure is short and less stones are there. Yes, sir. And sir, you told about the exchange of stents. So when in benign biliary stricture, let's say you have already placed two or three stents which are working well. Now it's a planned ERCP after three months. Will you remove all the three stents and then place four stents or you will just upgrade it and ex place an extra stent? Good question. I would actually remove all the stents because even if they look patent from the luminal side, from the duodenum, there is still some blockage inside and you cannot clean up the whole thing. And as most of you must have observed, when you remove these stents and do a balloon sweep, a lot of sludge mat came, comes out. Yeah. So it's best to clean up the whole bile duct and then place the stent. Now it works better. So try not to be too uh, conservative in the from cost perspective of placing an extra new bile duct stent. Uh, I think it's best to remove all of them and place uh, one number or two number higher than what you have done before, even yes. if it requires a balloon dilatation of the structure. So there is one more question by Dr. Kishore. In inoperable malignant biliary structure, biliary drainage for the purpose of start, starting chemotherapy when the patient is already poor for performance status, should we go ahead with biliary drainage or not? Patient is a malignant, unoperable malignant biliary obstruction and poor performance status, but still radiotherapists want to start a chemotherapy. In that scenario, will you go ahead with biliary drainage or not? I think I will not do anything in this patient who has a poor performance. Just if he is because of the disease per se, if he has had a contamination uh, by an unsuccessful ERCP few days back or a week back, then probably I will try it. And he was better in condition before then the justification of, of, of uh, in drainage comes in. But if he was a poor performance just because of ascites, low albumin, liver metastasis, I think I'll keep my ego down and, and say, uh, I will not be able to help you. I think we have to be very cognizant of the fact that we cannot cure everybody all the time. We try our best. And if we try explaining to the patient or his family that, look, this is the maximum that we can do. Everybody will have a reason to go away from Earth. And let's not expedite that exit. Yes. I think uh, we should, like many times we don't understand the concept of best supportive care. So we should, we know. Yes, best not. supportive care is, is what is needed. Yes. yes sir. There is also one question that you have already covered that how to manage hilar structure when primary confluence is not completely separated, but just involving the floor of the confluence. So... Yeah, Kishore, that's a good question. And I think just one stent is good enough because the floor is, uh, 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 the roof is patent. So it, one stent can uh, drain the other side also. Uh, it can be debated that it's just a thin communication between the two which will now get blocked in, in times to follow. And if you have a wire on both the sides, you are actually justified in placing two stents also. I think but probably. I would also encourage uh, most of you who are dealing with this is to do RFA. It works quite well. Actually, it's very easy to do. And uh, you can use the same catheter several times as well. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's the most important point. <laughs> Sir, uh, initially, there, uh, I got comments that uh, RFA should not be much used in a, in a, in a near confluence because the vessels are very near to the confluence and there can be a torrential bleeding. So, do you routinely still use uh, RFA in you know, when the primary uh, when the structure is very near to the confluence? Yeah, so that's a good question. In that situation, we reduce the power settings of the generator to seven watts instead of ten watts, which we use for the uh, distal bile duct uh, structures. Okay. Since the vessels are closed, so we don't want to go very deep in the burn. But if we can burn at least half the wall of the CBD, that's probably good enough for the stent to remain patent for longer time. Perfect. Right. 
so i think we i we have almost covered all the questions and uh, there are two more questions are now coming up so uh, if we have uh, in primary confluence is not patent and we have to put just one stent whether we should uh, we, uh, use the rhd or the lf uh, rhd go to the rhd which is a larger volume presumably as happens in most patients unless this patient had atrophy of the right for some reason Yes. So go to the site which has a which is likely to drain the largest volume of the liver. So I think we have completed all the questions. And uh, ma'am, is there are there any further questions from the floor? No. Okay. So I'll just share the last slide. But I don't know. I am not allowed to. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again for your time uh, from the your busy clinical practice. It was really a master okay. lecture, and we all have learned a lot during this lecture. And um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jimil, and everybody there who has joined this uh, a very good initiative uh, from Dr. Usha Datta and the entire team. And uh, Jimil, thank you very much for having me on the screen. Thank you, sir. Uh, with this, with uh, this, Dr. Laktagya, the way you answered questions stimulated people to ask for some more because they thought they'll get some answers. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you once again. And we have, uh, let me announce the next session, which is session number eight of the third season. And this is on the 25th August, 2023. We have Dr. Randir Sood speak to us on financial aspects for an endoscopist. How to choose your accessory, how to choose your scopes, which, how to manage your scopes uh, and which company, what uh, kind of features we look for when we are purchasing any equipment and maintaining any equipment. So all these components which any budding gastroenterologist needs to know uh, should be there and maybe some other session we will have how they can manage their own personal finances. So that's another aspect we can discuss later on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Okay. I think ma'am already Dr. Nitin Jaktab sir is already taking many uh, lectures on how to manage your personal finances. <laughs> we will invite him on next uh, season. <laughs> and we would also like to th sincerely thank our partners in this academic venture, that is Olympus Pfizer for supporting this academic program, and Invig and Torrent to help us uh, organizing these at various sites because maybe Dr. Laktakaya doesn't know that we usually have each of these institutions open up their lecture theater halls so that all the students can sit in one place and learn together. I thank saw the students you. sitting there. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, thank so you. Jimmy. Wonderful. Bye bye. Have thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Jimmy. Thank, thank you, you ma'am.